Welcome to About Scripture, a podcast designed to take the listener deeper into Scripture and biblical thought. This podcast is brought to you in partnership with Heritage Christian University, where we help students to thrive in ministry. To find out more, go to hcu.edu. We're also partnering with the Ministry League Network. And now, welcome to the podcast. How easy it is to worship idols, to convince ourselves that God doesn't mind, or that he really wouldn't expect us to stand against an entire culture. Idolatry is all around us in a slightly less conspicuous way than it was in the ancient Near East or in ancient Greece and Rome, or in many modern nations. In the West, we have renamed our idols so that it becomes a little less obvious how we have betrayed the faith we confess. Of course, Jesus isn't buying it. He recognizes that many people serve mammon alongside God, which is as he tells us, an impossible task. Jesus didn't actually use the word idolatry, but Paul did, Colossians 3.5. And if greed can be considered a form of idolatry because it divides our loyalties, then so can all kinds of other things, career, social status, political correctness, Social media, entertainment, houses, cars, food, sex, sports. The fact that we don't call these things idols makes the sin all the harder to recognize. The fact that each of these things is perfectly innocuous in moderation and in the right circumstances makes the idolatry all the more insidious. On second thought, sometimes our idols are named as such. Have y'all heard of a TV show called American Idol? In Daniel 3, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are confronted with an idol. Not an inconspicuous idol, but one very much larger than life, easy to recognize, It was made of gold, and it was 60 cubits tall, something like 90 feet. And it was six cubits wide, about nine feet. 90 feet tall. For comparison, the statue of the sitting Abraham Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. is 19 feet tall. And the building itself, the Lincoln Memorial, is 99 feet tall. I suppose a statue in and of itself wouldn't be an idol. We have statues all over the place that we don't regard as idols. But Nebuchadnezzar wanted his subjects to fall down and worship the statue. That's Daniel 3 verse 5. And the people did just as Nebuchadnezzar demanded. They fell down and worshipped the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Chapter 3 verse 10. They all, like sheep, have gone astray. They have drunk the Kool-Aid. Well, not everybody. Three Jewish boys refused. Now, presumably Daniel didn't fall down in front of the statue either, but this chapter does not mention Daniel at all. It focuses on Daniel's friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We have been briefly introduced to these friends in the first two chapters, in stories that focused mostly on Daniel. After Daniel 3, the focus shifts back to Daniel, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are never mentioned again. Before they exit stage left, we have one powerful story demonstrating their total allegiance to God. Let's not kid ourselves. Even though these Jewish boys are being told to perform what is obviously a sin, 
it must have been difficult for them to decide what to do. None of that difficulty is reflected in this chapter, which shows the boys resolved to disobey the king, but we can guess at this difficulty because we are humans, and it would probably be difficult for us. Everybody else is doing it, apparently without any scruples. Resisting would mean certain death, unless God intervenes, as the boys are hoping. Wouldn't we do a better job of testifying to our God by staying alive rather than by dying? Is it really idolatry to bow down to this statue? Isn't it really the heart that matters? So if we're not inwardly bowing down to the statue, but only doing so outwardly, maybe it doesn't really count? My guess is that most of us would have a very hard time figuring out what to do which is why we need stories like Daniel 3. Nebuchadnezzar front confronts these boys and gives his command directly to them in verses 13 to 15, in a speech that ends with the rhetorical question, who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? I love Jerome's imagined response to this question. You remember Jerome, the 4th century Latin writer? Jerome imagines this response. Who is the God that will deliver you out of my hands? Why, naturally, that same God whose servant you recently worshipped and whom you asserted to be truly God of gods and Lord of kings in Daniel chapter 2, verses 46 and 47. Maybe Nebuchadnezzar is thinking that revealing secrets, like Daniel did in chapter 2, Revealing secrets is one thing, but delivering from a fiery furnace is something altogether different. The boys do not hesitate. This is verses 16 to 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. The highlight here is, but if not. The boys have confidence in their God, but they don't have complete confidence in their ability to predict what God will do. He can save us, but sometimes he chooses not to, for whatever reason. In this context, we, we might remember the prayer of Paul, that God would remove the thorn in his flesh only to be told, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. Or even more relevant, we may recall the prayer of Jesus that the Father would take this cup from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. We remember the outcome of that prayer. The Father did not remove the cup. Jesus tells his followers to take up their own crosses. The boy's response to Nebuchadnezzar might also remind us of this other statement from Jesus when he was facing certain death. Jesus said, You would have no power over me if it were not given you from above. That one's John 19.11. Probably in a reflection on this story in Daniel 3, another ancient Jewish document, and this one is 4th Maccabees from the end of the first century AD. 4th Maccabees puts these words into the mouth of a Jew facing the choice of death or apostasy. And I'm going to quote from 4th Maccabees chapter 10, verse 14. This Jew says to his persecutor, you do not have a fire hot enough to make me play the coward. 
God does save the boys, after all. Some sort of supernatural person joins the boys in the furnace. One that seemed to Nebuchadnezzar to have, quote, the appearance of a son of the gods, Daniel 3.25, or something like that, a son of God, the son of God. It's been translated in different ways. The king later calls this fourth person an angel in verse 28. Who was it? The text does not say, or at least the Aramaic text does not say. Y'all realize that Daniel was not written completely in Hebrew. There's a big chunk of it that's in Aramaic. We're in the Aramaic part now. The Aramaic text doesn't tell us who this fourth person in the furnace was. The Septuagint specifies that it was an angel of the Lord. Of course, angel of the Lord has for a long time by Christians been considered one of the titles of Jesus. And indeed, in early Christianity, it was common to identify this fourth person as the pre-incarnate Christ. It would be difficult to argue against that interpretation, but it would also be difficult to know for sure. In the 4th century AD, Jerome expressed some doubts. He said, As for the appearance of the fourth man, which he asserts to be like that of a son of God, either we must take him to be an angel, as the Septuagint has rendered it, or indeed, as the majority think, the Lord our Savior. But Jerome concludes, Yet I do not know how an ungodly king could have merited a vision of the Son of God. In any case, this fourth person brought the salvation of God. It might be significant to recognize that God does not intervene in this story until the last possible minute. Ellen Davis has helpfully brought up this point. She says, For this particular storyteller, it is surely important that the fourth figure becomes visible only in the furnace, the locus of the most intense suffering. This story encourages us to trust God all the way, even to death and beyond. Part of what I imagine made the boys pause when they initially heard the command about bowing down to the statue, is the suddenness of the change in Babylonian policy. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had been able to carve out a pretty comfortable existence, even in exile. They were honored, along with Daniel, as wise men, wiser than others, experts in Babylonian literature. And Nebuchadnezzar had seemed open to their practicing their religion, however they chose. Then the king makes a new law, one that must have seemed to him rather innocent, encouraging loyalty among the diverse population of the empire. That's the line the Judean boys can't cross. The resolve of these boys had been made easier, no doubt by their earlier stand in regard to the luxurious foods of Babylon. They had already refused to become completely assimilated to their new culture. They had already resolved to maintain their distinctiveness. They had already determined that they needed to hold Babylon at arm's length. And so when the shock of this new command came to them, they had trained themselves to face the challenge. You've seen clips of the Nazi propaganda film Triumph of the Will from 1934. I doubt you've endured watching the whole thing. You can find it online, and it is generally considered one of the greatest documentaries ever made. But you can probably hold that opinion only if you don't watch it. That's exactly the position that Roger Ebert found himself in a few years before his death after decades of supposing that everyone knew what they were talking about when they acclaimed the film as so great. 
Upon watching it in his older age, Ebert wrote, It is a terrible film, paralyzingly dull, simple-minded, overlong, and not even manipulative because it is too clumsy to manipulate anyone but a true believer. So I'm not recommending the film to you, not because I think it will make you a Nazi, but because it's a boring film. But the reason I wanted to bring it up, the film, is that it documents a rather sudden shift in German society. The film focuses on a pro-Hitler rally in 1934. Remember, Hitler had become German chancellor in 1933. So this is just a little bit later. But the people worship Hitler. Pastor Julius Leuthäuser exclaimed, Christ has come to us through Adolf Hitler. Through his power, his honesty, his faith, and his idealism, the Redeemer has found us, and we know the Savior today has come. That's the 20th century. There might be political figures even today who elicit similar devotion. Now, in the 21st century in America, how much would our country have to change for it to require of us things that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were not willing to do? Maybe it's already there. Maybe it's not. In any case, change can come suddenly. Are we ready to imitate these boys? They got themselves ready by training themselves to resist the empire's allures. Perhaps we should think of ways of doing this as well. Sometimes we say, well, if you were in that situation in Daniel 3, you don't know how you would respond. You really don't know until you're in that situation. That may be true to some extent, but we can train ourselves. After all, we don't accept those sorts of excuses from, let's say, our military. It's not like an army general ever tells the president, can send troops into this area, but we really don't know how they'll respond because they've never been in that situation. True, some soldiers will get into a tense situation and react rather through fear rather than in accordance with their training, but the point of the training is to minimize that response. We need training to hold the earthly kingdoms at arm's length. The New Testament repeatedly encourages to prepare for suffering. Our danger in the 21st century America is that we have become so accustomed to comfort. We have become so unfamiliar with suffering that we misinterpret our society and suffering. And we think that the prospect of the loss of, let's say, our church, church's tax-exempt status is persecution. Of course, we should by all means willing, be willing to forgo our tax-exempt status, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to do a great deal more than that. And so are many other Christians around the world today. Just do an online search for modern Christian martyrdom, and you'll find that it's on the rise. Daniel 3 reminds us of the commitment we have made to taking up our cross that we sometimes sing about. Our fathers, chained in prisons dark, were still in heart and conscience free, and blessed would be their children's fate if they, like them, should die for thee. Faith of our fathers, holy faith, we will be true to thee till death. Or, in the words of our Lord, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Thank you.